All right, everyone. So uh, this morning, uh, the great and powerful Eli, who you all, I think, by this point know quite well, um, is going to be giving a lecture on evaluation metrics. Morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to try this without the mic uh, because we're worried about the echoes on the recording. And so let me know if you can't hear, and I'll either speak up or we'll turn the mic on. So to start with, if you'll all indulge me, sorry, you're. Okay. We can also, all right, we'll try yeah, this. We can spread out and share it it seems like people are, are fine with the mic, so. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so today we're gonna talk about evaluation metrics, uh, which is, as you might imagine, a super important topic for, for machine learning and therefore for you. And so to start with, if you could all indulge me and just take a minute to write down the goal of your project in one sentence, just at a, at a high level, what is the goal of your project? What are you hoping to accomplish this summer? Is anyone uh, keen to share what they wrote? I'll arbitrarily pick on Alex because I can. Okay. Uh, I said, I want to build a CV on um, to determine the predictive capabilities of bumblebee buzzers on a bumblebee tracking on an empty route. Great, very precise. Um, Catherine, do you mind sharing yours? Yes. I have um, to, build, well, to build a computer model to be able to evaluate the time series of winter weather events on uh, animal movement. Cool. That's great. And so I want you to keep these goals in mind as we go through the lecture today, because evaluation metrics are all about translating our goals into mathematical statements that we can check and compare in an objective way. And so to that end, I write down one more sentence, which is, I will know my project was successful if blank. So what's the signal you're going to get to know that what you've done has worked? It's not necessarily a mathematical thing, a qualitative or words is fine. Okay, Roni, I'm going to pick on you this time. Can you uh, read your previous sentence and then this sentence? Yeah. Um, I want to be able to run a computer based on the predictive disturbance talking through the video. That will be a measure of efficiency. And I will know it was successful in the air of the prediction relative to the surrounding trees and blessings. Cool. So that's nice. Is it like a threshold on some kind of metric that determines the level that is acceptable or successful? Does anyone else want to share theirs? I'm keep picking people in my group if no one volunteers. But Peggy? <laughs> cool, that's great. And so this lecture is going to be about like, what is that metric the system makes? You know, what are the different ways we can measure performance quantitatively. And so metrics, this is a word that's kind of, you know, used loosely a lot, but in our context, it can be thought of as mathematical statements of goals. And so usually something you want to minimize or maximize. So maybe you want to uh, maximize accuracy or minimize error or something along those lines. And so to start with a bit of motivation, let's talk about what metrics are for and how they're used before we dive in any particular examples. The biggest use in machine learning is that we'd like to use metrics to objectively compare different approaches to a problem. And so there are 
you know, as you've all seen in your reading groups, right, there's like hundreds of different ways to get at any of these problems. You have all these choices. Um, you know, you may, you have to choose an architecture, you have to choose a loss function, you have to choose pre-processing steps for your data. You have a huge design space here. And so with all these choices, how do we know what to do? And so metrics help us to solve that problem. I'm gonna let you in on the secret to how all computer vision systems are designed. You first start with something quote unquote reasonable where that's you know up to you really. And so it's our job here as instructors to help you figure out what is a reasonable place to start. And then you check your validation performance to see how well your quote unquote reasonable thing is doing. And then you decide if it's good enough somehow. And if it is good enough, then you check your test performance and you write your paper and you go home. And if it's not good enough, you make some kind of quote unquote reasonable change and go back and check the validation performance again. And you repeat this until it is good enough and you're happy or you give up. And so those are, this is how computer vision systems are developed in this kind of iterative metric driven way. And so in this way, we can choose things like what architecture to use, what the learning rate should be, um, and any kind of parameters you've been wondering about for your systems. It's all about computing these metrics and seeing which one does better. And metrics also help us measure pro progress in the field of computer vision more generally. So when you hear us say things like, um, like a, a ResNet 50 is better than an AlexNet, what we mean is that over time, what we've seen is in many contexts, a ResNet 50 performs better than an AlexNet in certain metrics on certain tasks. And so the, the codified knowledge of the field about what is good and what is bad is a consequence of these metrics uh, and have a and kind of consistency in those metrics over time. So this is a plot from a, a really cool website called paperswithcode.com. And so if you go to papers with code, you can like pick a data set and it will plot the performance of like hundreds. And it'll show you at any given point in time, what happens to be the best number it knows about. And so you can do all kinds of fun slicing and dicing of sort of the history of the field and comparing uh, what, met what methods are currently best on a given task. And so now we're gonna start to get into the actual metrics. And it's a tricky problem to present because there's tons of metrics. Every different flavor of computer vision problem has its own metrics. And so to try to organize this knowledge, we're gonna talk about um, measuring difference first. So these are kind of the building blocks for all of the metrics you're gonna see in computer vision. At the root, there's some kind of measurement of are these two things similar? So one way to think about metrics is that they measure the similarity between predictions and the truth or dissimilarity. So it could be accuracy or error. We use them kind of interchangeably because you can easily flip it around and go the other way. So the question is, how can we measure similarity between different types of objects? And by types of objects, you probably noticed that there's lots of kind of formats for outputs and labels in all your projects. So maybe you're doing classification or detection or segmentation. Each of those has its own sort of geometry, like is it a box? Is it just a, a discrete integer telling you the class label? Is it a segmentation mask that shows you a continuous area in the image? And so each of these kinds of objects has a different natural way to measure similarity. So for discrete objects, this is meant to be a visualization of two vectors and the color is like the class label. So it's zero, one or two here. And the canonical way to measure whether two lists of things are the same, if they're discrete objects like, you know, letter ABC or one, two, three, is to check every entry and see whether they're the same or different. And what, what we're going to compute here, this Hamming distance is the number of entries that are different between these two vectors. So it's a very simple way of just saying like, if we have two discrete objects, how can we measure how similar they are? So maybe the top is the predictions of a classifier. So if it's like cat, or, cat dog or horse, you know, zero, one, two, and the bottom might be a ground truth, zero, one, two. And then the number we're gonna compute here is how many entries they differ on. So it's just your raw error rate on that task. So this is the first prototype, this is discrete distances. The second prototype is continuous distances. So instead of having a list of things that are discrete, like ABC or one, two, three, we have a list of continuous numbers and we wanna know how similar or different it is to a second list of continuous numbers. And so here we're visualizing those two lists as these uh, dotted curves. So if you have a, a list of temperatures for every day in a month, 
that's a good example of what this could be. So if the top is the temperatures in June and the bottom is temperatures in December every day of the month, then one way to measure how different they are is to just subtract the two, take the absolute value, and then average it over all of the entries. And so this, this is a prototype for comparing two objects that are lists of continuous numbers. And the third prototype, and the final one, is spatial overlap. And this is not truly distinct from the previous two. We'll, we can talk about that later. But it, it's used in a different way. And so when you're measuring spatial overlap, you have, say, two bounding boxes. And the, the most common way to measure how similar they are is to first compute the intersection. So that's the area they share in common. That's this top picture. And then compute the area of the union, which is if you, uh, say, you combine them into one object, what is the area of that shape? And then you just divide them. And so this would be zero if there's no overlap, and it'll be one if they overlap perfectly. And you can also do this with amorphous blobs, like in segmentation, we'll talk about that later as well, but there's no need for this to be boxes. So this is the prototype for measuring how similar two spatial regions are. The question is, what's IOU? Let me know if I fail to repeat things. I need to repeat them for the reporting. So IOU, it just means intersection over union because we're taking the area of the intersection and dividing it by the area of the union. There will probably be lots of things like that where I put something on the screen and forget to define it. So definitely flag those when they come up. And so the, the fun thing is that most of the metrics that any of you are gonna use in your projects are just different combinations of these three ideas. And so we're gonna see that repeatedly throughout the rest of this lecture. But keep these prototypes in mind. So even if you're doing something that feels continuous to you, like detection or segmentation, uh, in the background, the discrete metrics are going to pop up. And so it's not as simple as if you're doing detection, you use IOU. In reality, most metrics uh, that are used in practice combine these things in some way. And so going back to the goal you wrote down earlier, think about whether you know, which of these building blocks seems like the relevant prototype for you or the most relevant. You probably need more than one of them. Are your outputs continuous? Are they discrete? Are they spatial or some kind of combination? So we're not gonna go around for this one, but kind of be keeping your problem in the back of your mind as we go through this lecture. And if, if at any point you feel like you, you don't understand how you would measure something for your problem, you know, raise your hand and we can talk about it. So now we're gonna dig into some actual metrics that are used in practice in computer vision systems. And the first and simplest sort of machine learning problem is binary classification. And so even if you're doing detection or segmentation, you know, you should, you should still care about binary classification because almost every machine learning problem at some point boils down to some kind of binary classification. So if you're doing detection and you're predicting class labels, there will come a point where you're, where you want to know whether those class labels are right or wrong. And so you're going to be doing some kind of discrete metric on them. And so binary classification is like at the core of many of these metrics, even outside of multi-class classification. Uh, it is less true for regression, but it can be. It depends on the, the metric you use for regression. So we'll talk about that. Um, but yes, it is less true for regression, I think. And so in binary classification, most of what we're gonna talk about is this, I'm gonna keep using this slide as kind of our guidepost. Um, and so in binary classification, we mostly use these sort of discrete metrics where we're trying to see, are these two lists of discrete objects similar or different? And so just to remind you all of the binary classification setting, for each image, we have a ground truth value, which is zero or one. And we make a prediction, which is some kind of continuous value between zero and one. And that's just what the network spits out. We need to convert that number. You could think of it as probability. It's gonna say something like 0.7. And so the way we tend to interpret that is the model has a 0.7 confidence that the, that the class is present. So in this case, this, this bird. And in most of these metrics, there's gonna be a step where we binarize the predictions by choosing a threshold T. And we say any predictions above the threshold are considered positives and any predictions below the threshold are considered negatives. So that's how we get from our continuous predictions to discrete objects that we can compare against the ground truth labels. I don't have questions about the setting. Or that. 
plus one, minus one, zero, one, uh, any of these things are fine. You can, as long as you have two outcomes. Yeah. So the first thing we're gonna look at is just a bit of pseudocode to make it concrete, uh, to make this picture here concrete, where we're comparing entry by entry to discrete objects. This is the sort of Python code for doing that. So uh, Hamming distance is what this is often called. And so you feed in your predictions and your labels. So these are both just lists. And every element of threads is a number between 0 and 1. And every element of labels is an integer 0 or 1. And then you give it a threshold between 0 and 1. So often we do 0.5 uh, because that's right in the middle. The first step here is to binarize your predictions. So when we say preds greater than thresh, what happens is it's going to give us a, a list of ones and zeros, and it's going to be a one wherever the prediction is bigger than the threshold and a zero elsewhere. So preds uh, bin here is the binarized predictions. And then the number of errors we're seeing is just the sum of the uh, comparison between those two. So we are going to find out where the preds are the same as the labels, or sorry, we're going to find out where they're different from the labels. And then we're just going to sum up the number of differences that are there. Um, or you could do a mean here. It depends on the context to whether you want to divide by the number of objects. And so this is the implementation of comparing whether two discrete objects are, are the same or not. So for binary label vectors, it, it's this simple. And so one that's a little more, and it's a lot of lines here, uh, one that's a little more um, commonly used in practice is uh, precision. And so precision says, if my classifier says that it's, um, if I predict that it's positive, how often am I right about that? And so um, similarly, it, it's a lot of the same operations where you first binarize your predictions, you compute how many things did I predict that are positive, how many things are truly positive. So we're seeing where the binary predictions are the same as the labels, and then we're seeing where the labels are one. So this is telling us where which positives are correct. Uh, computing the number of true positives, so in the labels. Um, oh, whoops, that's a typo, so that should be something different. Um, and then we just divide two of these things and return it. So this is one of the many ways that's a, a minor variation on the Hamming distance that allows you to get a different kind of number. There's about like 20 of these so on Wikipedia. If you go to the Precision of Recall page, there's a great like table this big with all of the different names for all of the different combinations of these things. So basically you compute like, you know, true positive rate, false negative rate, false positive rate, true positive rate, and you can combine them in all kinds of ways and you'll get different metrics that like people in the medical community like certain things and people in our community like certain things. Um, so anyway, this is not that you need to memorize this, but this is just one of the very common examples of a of a metric you can compute on uh, binary labels that is a little more complex than the um, than the Hamming distance. And so precision. Oh, sorry. oh, Wikipedia. So Wikipedia. There's a Wikipedia page for precision and recall. If you search for like precision recall, this is like a great big huge table in the middle of that Wikipedia page that I look up all the time. Um, <laughs> Really recommend, yeah. We typically do binarize when we're evaluating classification problems. Um, no, nothing would stop you from checking that other metric, though. You know, if, if there's a reason that's reasonable for your problem, that's totally fine. It, it, it's true sometimes to do something like we're going to get to that. Yeah. But yeah, so, so you're, you're right to pick up that like the threshold is kind of annoying, right? So like, how do you pick this? If you pick a different one, you're going to get a different number. But, you know, we don't tend to like metrics that behave that way where we have to make arbitrary choices. Uh, and so this is precision. We're going to talk about its, its partner, recall, which is a similar but different number. So we say, if, if it is a positive example, how often do I say it's positive? So intuitively, it's like how many of the how many of the things that are really positive do you catch in your net? Whereas precision is saying how uh, how precise are you about the things you say are positive? So they're measuring different things. And so both of these are things that you that are implemented in sklearn and elsewhere. So like you know you, you shouldn't need to write the code to do this yourself. This is just you can see how they're computed. 
but it's a lot of this just like you take two vectors, you compare them entry-wise, you add up the number of things that meet a certain condition, you divide them, uh, the operations tend to be very simple. And so now we're gonna talk about what Sarah was just mentioning, which is the precision recall curve. And so we're gonna forget about the internals of those functions we just looked at and just have the, you know, the, the functions available for calling in the top right hand corner here. And this is the way that we avoid having to make arbitrary decisions about threshold is just to sweep over all of the thresholds. So the first thing to think about is if we set the threshold to zero, then we're going to predict positive for everything. And then we're going to have perfect recall, right? Because for every positive example out there, we're predicting that it's positive. So recall will be perfect if you set a threshold of zero. And so we get this point on the x-axis over here. Uh, the problem is that precision will be terrible because uh, you are predicting that everything is positive and that, and therefore the things that, you know, assuming that that's not true about your data set, which it usually isn't, then your prediction will suffer because you're not being very uh, careful with the things you're finding as positive. And so if you go the other way and set the thresholds very, very close to one, you get you know, perfect precision because only your most confident predictions will, uh, will be passed as positives and then you're, you're likely to be right about them. And so in between, as you vary this threshold, you sweep out a curve that tends to look like this, like a downward sloping curve. And so this is the precision recall curve. And there are tools that will compute this for you. All you need to give it is, is the predictions and the labels, and it will give you all of this. The problem is this is a curve, right? And so it's fine to look at, but it's hard to summarize. And like, how do I know if my curve is better than your curve? And so what we do is we compute the area under this curve, and that gives us a number between zero and one, and this is called the average precision. So average precision is a good example of something that shows up all the time. So in detection, you use a metric called mean average precision. You can do pixel average precision and segmentation. It's everywhere. So this is the sense in which these binary segmentation metrics are, are ubiquitous throughout other problems, even if you're not doing binary classification. Okay, so that's been binary classification. And we're gonna to turn to a couple of things specific to multi-label, or sorry, multi-class classification now. And so we're still in this realm of comparing discrete objects to each other. So we're gonna have two, a list of labels and a list of class predictions. And the setting is that each image has a ground truth value between, you know, it's a label from one to C or zero to C minus one. And the prediction is a value between zero and one for every class. So this image is gonna go into the network and it's gonna spit out a prediction uh, for bird and dog and bear and, and whatever else. You're gonna have a prediction for every class. And those predictions will sum to one. So it'll be a probability distribution over the classes. And so the big metric here is top K accuracy. And so the top K accuracy is the fraction of images such that the correct label is among the K most confident predictions. So uh, to unpack this a little bit, when you, your model makes a prediction, it's gonna give you a, uh, when you put it in an image, it will give you a value for every class and you can sort them from high to low. And then that's a, that's a listing of classes that it thinks are correct from most confident to least confident. And then you take the top K of those and you see if the label is in there. So to be a little more clear about it, uh, the most common thing you see is top one accuracy or if someone just says accuracy, usually this is what they mean, uh, where you feed in the image and you make your predictions. And so we have here five classes and each class has an associated number between zero and one. We look at, we find the class that has the highest predicted value. So the most confident class, and that is uh, class zero here. And then we compare it to the ground truth and it's either right or wrong whether those numbers are exactly the same or not. And so an example, if we did uh, top three accuracy, it would be the same, except we're in this last step, we take the top three most confident classes, and then we see if the ground truth label is any of them. And if it is, we get credit for predicting that image correctly. So this is often important in contexts where you, uh, you just wanna make recommendations. So for instance, you all did INAT on, over the weekend, 
And so that's an example where they probably don't care as much about top one accuracy, just the, the very most confident prediction. They care about whether they're showing you a short list of things that are reasonable for uh, the, the animal you're looking at. So top three accuracy is probably great because then if you only have to look at three things, then you know, that's a pretty, it's good for the educational experience. So, so, since we talked about classification a little bit, we're going to move on to um, discussing imbalance. I know it's something that a lot of you are worried about and have been asking about. So we're not going to talk about training with imbalanced data. We're going to talk about if you have an imbalanced test set, how do you evaluate that in a way that is uh, interesting or that is, is fair in a certain way? So we're, we're still in this realm of comparing discrete objects. So just to Step back a second, we're going to go back into the binary classification setting. So each image has a zero or one label, and we have a prediction between zero and one. And we'll often do this binarization where we pick a threshold, and things that are bigger than thresholds are positives, and things that are lower than thresholds are negatives. So if we look at these uh, predictions, and so if the top one is predictions and the bottom one is the labels, Nine out of 10 of these are the same. And so in terms of regular old accuracy, we get 90%. And so that's great, right? We're happy with 90%. But you also get 90% if this is the case, right? If you're, if you have this imbalanced set of labels on the bottom where nine out of 10 of them are class zero and one of them is class one. And then you just always predict the majority class. And so this is a way to get good performance while learning absolutely nothing. You know, this method won't generalize at all and it will do bad things when you try to use it. And so we'd like to have a metric that can tell these two cases apart because regular old accuracy is not doing it. Uh, but luckily the solution is actually really simple. So what we do is it's called class balance, top one accuracy. And so we compute the top one accuracy for each class independently. And then we just average the results. And this has the effect of weighting each class inversely proportional to the number of uh, number of times it appears. And so to see an example, if we were doing class balance top one accuracy here, we get four out of five of the black squares right, we get five out of five of the white squares right, so that gives us 90%. So in this case, uh, the, because this is a balanced test set, you get the same result as if you had used regular classification. But on this other example, where we have the imbalanced test set, you get nine out of nine correct on the uh, white boxes and only and zero out of one correct on the black boxes. And so you wind up with a 45% class balanced accuracy. So this is a, it's a very simple way to get a metric that is sensitive to class balance. And we're gonna see this over and over again. So, so in, every, uh, in every one of these contexts, segmentation detection, there are versions of this where they do class balanced uh, whatever class balance, average precision, or things like that. Cool. So we're going to move on to regression, regression unless there are questions about uh, these classification metrics. Cool. So for regression, we're going to uh, be talking more about um, the case where we're comparing two objects that have continuous values. So we can no longer compare if things that are exactly equal because usually in continuous land, nothing's ever exactly equal, right? The temperature today is unlikely to be exactly the same as the temperature any other time, um, depending on how, how many decimal places you use. So we need something that is a little more relaxed about what similarity can mean. And so the prototypical example of this is uh, mean absolute error, for instance. So you have, uh, this is what you would get if you said, okay, I'm going to take my list of numbers and plot it in that plot lib or something. You would get a plot of index on the x-axis versus value on the y-axis. And so you uh, can take your two vectors and just take the absolute value of the difference between them and you, you know, average it. It's a very simple way to compare whether two continuous objects are the same. And in regression, uh, the problem setting is that you have, uh, as a ground truth, a continuous value between 0 and 1, and the prediction is also a continuous value between 0 and 1. Uh, so oh, that's an extra slide. OK, so yeah, we just saw this mean absolute error. So it's not only the prototype for how to compare uh, continuous objects, but it's also a totally fine metric in its own right on regression problems. 
So if you're predicting temperature over the month and uh, you have the ground truth temperature over the month, this is a perfectly good way to uh, compare how accurate, uh, to compute how your accuracy on that prediction task. There's also lots of variants of this. So you could also do uh, mean squared error, which you probably heard of, which is exactly what it sounds like. You take these differences, you square them, and you sum them up. And the other big one that's often used is R squared, which I'm sure you've all seen before as well. And so this is the, the slope of the line of best fits. Uh, and it's also, it's a number between zero and one that measures correlation between your two, uh, between your predictions and your ground proof. And so you see this a lot in uh, machine learning papers on regression tasks, where they're, they're evaluating the, uh, the correlation between what's predicted and what's true. This is the end of our lightning tour on regression. So if there's any, you know, questions about this, we can discuss it. But these are, these are mostly pretty natural and they're things that you've mostly seen before. So we didn't want to spend too much time on it. Cool. So next up, semantic segmentation, which, uh, so a lot of the remote sensing folks will be in this camp, um, trying to uh, do like land cover mapping as a good example of a semantic segmentation task. And so for semantic segmentation, we actually have uh, our first um, combination. So we often combine comparisons of discrete objects with um, uh, area of overlap computations. And so the setting here is that for each image, you have a ground truth label from you know, one to C or zero to C minus one for every single pixel. I didn't want to color this in, so I've, I've just drawn the, the polygon there. But it would, it would be like if all the background pixels were zero and everything inside the red polygon was one, that would be a semantic segmentation, binary semantic segmentation in this case. And then your prediction is a continuous value between zero and one for every class at every pixel. And so the simplest way to compute accuracy in semantic segmentation is something called pixel accuracy, which is exactly the same as uh, the Hamming distance we've seen before. So what we do is for every pixel, we make our predictions across the classes. We take the class that has the most confident prediction, and that is our, you know, that's our prediction for that pixel. Then we can make a map of all of those predictions for every pixel and compare it to the map of ground truth labels, and you're either right or wrong on every single pixel. So you can do the, you know, this kind of discrete metric directly on semantic segmentation. But it has the same problem. Right, so if, if this bird was a small object, for instance, the vast majority of the pixels would be zero, would be the background class. And so you get this imbalance problem right away in semantic segmentation. Um, and so this metric is not often used because of that. The uh, more common metric is something called IOU, which we've talked about before, intersectional reunion. And so like we said, then it doesn't have to be boxes. So you can have on the left, the, uh, the ground truth and on the right, your prediction. And so the prediction kind of you know, nets together this pole and the bird. And so you have some pixels in there that are wrong. And basically what you do is you compute, you just overlay these two polygons, you compute the pixels they have in common, and you compute the, their union. So all the pixels that you'd have if you pretended they were the same object and you compute IOU and that gives you a number between zero and one that tells you how good how close your prediction fits the ground truth here. Uh, in the last slide, you mentioned that accuracy is a common for um, segmentation. Is it a red flag in making accuracy? I feel like that's a really common metric for a lot of people that are favored, but it's because you raise the case that that might not be the best. So the question is is it a red flag if you see pixel accuracy in a remote sensing paper because it doesn't handle balance well? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, as we're going to talk about later, it's good to use multiple metrics, and it, it's fine to include extra ones. It's seldom a bad thing to have extra metrics. Uh, if you were relying on it to make your point in your paper, then it would be very important that you handle this imbalance question somehow. Because, for instance, if you have, if you're trying to do detection of something uh, rare, like uh, a rare species of tree, and you go over all of California, the vast majority of your pixels will be zero, and so you could always predict zero and get, you know, 99.9% .9 accuracy by just having enough negative pixels. So you, sh you should always look for some statement about how they handle the balance. And it could be at the level of the metrics, or it could be they've actually constructed a balanced test set, in which case it's fine. You don't need to worry about it.
Okay, and so we've tucked the IOU here, and uh, this is for one class. But just like in uh, in other cases we've seen, you can compute the IOU for each class independently, and you can average the results. And so this is the case in semantic segmentation where every single pixel is classified as one of C classes. You still want to handle that imbalance problem even between you know different positive classes. You know, it's not just positive in background; it's also different kinds of positive classes you care about. And so you can just compute the IOU for each class independently and average them, and then you have a, a class balance metric. So this one's pretty common in semantic segmentation. Any questions about semantic segmentation before we move on to detection? I hope you're seeing the through lines here. So I, mean, I think when you read these papers, it sounds like there's a million different metrics, but a lot of them have a lot in common. There's this core couple concepts, and they come up over and over again across all these different fields. And so likewise, just like in semantic segmentation, uh, where we're going to have uh, an overlap metric. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have pointed that out. So back here, I claim that uh, semantic segmentation is combining both some kind of discrete computation and an area overlap computation. Uh, that's not really true uh, in the example I picked here that I was making this slide this morning. Um, but it is true in some other metrics, like there's pixel average precision, for instance, where you compute uh, average precision per class. And so then you're using some of these classification metrics inside of the semantic segmentation evaluation. So you'll do like IOU computations, but you also often do um, some of these more discrete things. So you see like PXAP is pixel average precision sometimes. Uh, and so in detection, likewise, you have both discrete stuff and area overlap stuff. So this we're actually going to see. And so to remind you of the framework here, so in object detection for each image, as ground truth, you can have any number of bounding boxes, each of which has a class label. And you can predict any number of bounding boxes, each of which has a class label and a confidence score. And so the first step in a lot, and we're not going to go into all the details because detection metrics are actually kind of obnoxious. Um, so th there will be libraries that can do most of this for you. Um, but just so you uh, can see where these concepts come up, th the first step in a lot of detection pipelines after you get predictions out of your model is to match each ground truth box to the predicted box that is closest to it in terms of IOU. So if you think about a detector, it can spit out all the boxes at once. And some of them can be on nothing, or some of them can just have a partial overlap. And so we need to associate a predicted box to a ground truth box before we can see if it's like before we can basically say whether the thing in that ground truth box has been detected successfully. So you make your predictions and you match them into ground truth boxes by computing IOU scores. And so some predictions may not get matched to a ground truth box if they miss entirely. And so the second step is actually back in discrete land where we have a precision recall curve. And so there's, as this note on the side says, there are special rules for determining what counts as a true positive or false positive or false negative in detection. And so that's a conversation you can have with your instructor. Um, but for each class, once you have the detections matched to the ground truth boxes, you can compute precision recall curves. And like before, you run into the same problem where the vast majority of, you know, maybe your data set's imbalanced and you have 99% white-tailed deer and 1% the thing you care about. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And so then you can summarize this curve by taking the area under the curve, uh, average precision. And then uh, to, to handle the imbalance problem, you compute the average precision for each class independently, and then you average them together. And this is the mean average precision that you'll see in a lot of detection papers. And there are details in the background here about how you set certain thresholds and things like that. But conceptually, we're doing the same thing where we're uh, getting a list of predictions and a list of class labels and computing average precision, and then we're averaging them to balance it across classes. So any detection questions before we go on? OK, so now we're going to talk about a uh, kind of an advanced topic that is also very important called calibration. Uh, and so this is another property your model can have or not have. And it's another thing that you 
probably want to measure at some point, uh, depending on what exactly you're doing. And so in calibration, we're going to be talking about measuring the difference between two continuous things, and you'll see what they are in a minute. So first, what is calibration? We say that a model is calibrated if it can accurately represent its confidence. So if you make a prediction with your model and the predict and the, the value it gives you is 0.9, is it actually right 90% of the time or not? And so if you're interpreting your model predictions as probabilities, you need to be sure that it's calibrated first. Otherwise, you're going to be misled. I don't have any questions about like what calibration is or why it seems useful. Calibration. <laughs> Hi, Pietro. You guys see all met Pietro yesterday. Uh, a model is calibrated if it if when it gives you a prediction, that prediction reflects its confidence score. So the prediction will be a number between zero and one. Uh, sorry, the confidence will be a number between zero and one. And if the confidence is point nine, you want it to be actually right ninety percent of the time. You want to be able to interpret the output of the model as a probability. And so you can only do that with a straight face when the model has been calibrated. And uh, the thing to know is that most models are not calibrated right out the gate. There's been some work that has showed that as we've continued to make these big, huge deep learning models, the calibration properties have gotten worse. And so this is what's called a reliability diagram. And so on the x-axis, we have bins of confidence scores. So these are this is basically a histogram of your model predictions uh, on the x-axis. So if your model predicts between uh, you know, between zero and 0.1, it goes in the first bin. If it predicts between 0.1 and 0.2, it goes in the second bin. And then on the y-axis, we have the accuracy. So for instance, this bar is saying, if this is you know, 0.1, 0.2, of all of the things your model predicted between 0.1 and 0.2, how often would it write? Is it 20% of the time? And if, if it was 20% of the time, it would be up at that dash line. So the gap between the blue bars and the dashed line tell us the extent to which the model fails to be calibrated. And so once you have your model predictions and your labels, you can compute this object and look at it if you'd like to. That's all you need as inputs here. Uh, and there's a little uh, step here where, so, so the, in the expected calibration error, the way you summarize this, this graph into one number is basically just a weighted average of these blue bars or of the gap between the blue bars and the uh, dashed line. So it's just weighted by the number of predictions that actually fall in that bin. Then have any questions about this plot? Right. The error that Where is the it's, it's this weighted average um, up in the top right. So it's, it's not a straight up average because for instance, you could have a bunch of your predictions that are in one bin and another bin that's basically empty. So you don't want to just average the bins because that will ignore the actual uh, the distribution of your predictions. And so there's this weighting term uh, BM. And, and you can ignore the 30.6 right now. They may have been doing something a little different in this paper, but th this thing in the top right is the number you would want to compute to summarize a reliability diagram. Because you're right, it does not seem like 30.6 is the average of those differences between, you know, within zero one. So it's probably a different number. But ECE, the expected calibration error, is the number you want to be computing. And there's a link here at the bottom left to a paper about this if you want to read more about it. OK, and so now we're going to, I don't know how much time we have left. Let's see, 10 minutes, cool. Uh, we're going to turn over to sort of a, a more just like discussing a few highlights or important points about metrics and evaluation. So there any questions about the previous content, we should talk about that now, or we can get into some of this more discussion-y stuff. Cool. So the first one uh, that some of you might be wondering is what's the difference between a metric and a loss? Because you, you have these loss functions you've heard about that you use to train stuff, and now we're talking about metrics. What's the difference? The answer is that there's not really a profound difference between them. So a loss is just a metric that you're using to train your model that happens to be differentiable. The metrics, metrics are a more general category. 
uh, I would say that a loss is a metric. It's just a particular one you're using for a particular purpose. There's no deep difference there. Another question that often comes up, why use just one metric? And the answer is that there is not really a good reason to use just one metric. Every metric has limitations and is giving you an incomplete and biased picture of your results. And so it's often a good idea to compute multiple metrics that measure different aspects of the, of the problem you care about. Usually we start with one just for convenience and because we're lazy, but often it's, it's nice at some point to add in other metrics that every time you run your model, you're computing three or four complementary things that show you a more complete picture of what your model's doing. Yeah, yeah, so I would say that losses are just examples of metrics. A loss is a, is a metric you're using for a specific purpose to train your model. So for instance, you can use mean squared error as your training loss if you're doing regression, and you can also use it as a metric to measure performance on your test set. Uh, another important thing to be aware of is that your metrics are hiding things from you. Metrics, by the nature of boiling everything down to one number, they're oversimplifying things, right? So there will be aspects of the problem that are not captured by your one number that you've computed. And so it's often useful to take a metric and break it down into its constituents. So for instance, if you compute mean average precision in a detection problem, you often also want to compute the per class average precision scores and look at those. Because if you see, okay, look, my mean average precision is low, I don't know why, you could look at those per class average precision scores that went into the mean average precision, and you can see, like, oh, it's, it's doing really badly on certain categories of objects, but really well on other categories of objects. And that can help you decide what to do next to improve, uh, to improve your solution. Like if you're doing camera traps, you may want to look at per site accuracy instead of uh, your accuracy over all your data. Uh, or by time, if you're if you're predicting some kind of uh, uh, like time series thing, you may want to bin it by certain kinds of uh, like time that has cyclic variations. So like time of day would be a natural one for certain things. But it's often useful to just take your metrics and break them out into their parts and look a little more closely at what their uh, how that computation is being done. Another thing to consider: Do some mistakes matter more than others? So when we, talk, when we talk about accuracy or whatever, we're kind of treating all of our data the same. But if you're doing, say, camera trap stuff, maybe missing a rare species matters a lot more to you than missing a common one. And so you'd rather have, uh, you'd rather make the mistake of predicting too many bounding boxes than not enough. The price you pay would be more time reviewing these false positives, things like that. But you should think about whether there's sort of a, um, this is also often called cost-sensitive metrics. So if you have certain kinds of mistakes, should they cost you more than other kinds of mistakes? This is one of my things I always like to complain about as when is an improvement worth it? So you see lots of papers saying that they have done some magnificent thing that uh, makes the performance go up by say 2%. You know, my method is 2% better than method B. And on some data sets, that's actually quite a lot. So on ImageNet, like there probably hasn't been a 2% performance in years. And should you use it? Um, well, you should think about, is this new method slower? Is it more complicated? Is 2% on my problem worth the hassle? Often the answer is no. Often you should use a simple method and spend more time getting better data. And that's a better way to spend your resources than using the latest, fanciest method that is like heavier and more computer intensive and more complicated. So it's worth being a critical reader as, as you do these reading groups and see what is the magnitude of the improvement they're proposing? Are, are they getting just a tiny bit better by doing a lot of extra work? Or are they really, have they made such a big improvement that it would change the way these systems are used? Uh, should I implement my own metrics? Usually no. So there's really great tools out there. So sklearn is the biggest one. Uh, and I think Sarah's gonna talk about offline evaluation more next time, but basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna make your predictions and save them out to some kind of you know, format on disk or you're gonna save the model. And then you're gonna go to NumPy and you're gonna compute all your metrics that you want. Um, and most of those or all of those are implemented in sklearn. So if you want to compute precision recall curves, sklearn can do it for you or average precision. 
uh, if you're doing detections, these like the mean average precision stuff, there are also toolkits for doing that. Um, so you should definitely look around for implementations of these metrics before you implement them yourself. Um, usually they're not hard to implement, but it, it just opens you up to make mistakes and it can be more trouble than it's worth. Uh, does having the same metric guarantee a fair comparison? So, so if I tell you my accuracy and you tell me your accuracy and mine's better, um, you know, have I won something? Is this, uh, is, is my method actually better than yours? And the question is sometimes. If you want to have a fair comparison, you do control for as many factors as possible. So if you see two papers and one gets higher accuracy than the other, but one is using a gigantic, you know, big, huge model and one's using a smaller, simple model, then that's not really a fair comparison. We can't say that that method is better. Uh, it's just that if you invest more resources, you can make it do better. So you want to be sensitive to whether the comparisons are fair, even if they're using the same metric. And it's pretty easy to fool yourself. This happens all the time, even in computer vision research. So one of my favorite papers is uh, from a student of, student of Serge Belongi. And on the left here, this is these are just results on some data sets for a certain computer vision task. And on the left, we're showing what did the papers say their performance is? And it's going up and up and up and up. And so it's like, okay, we've made so much progress on this problem over the last, I don't know, 15 years. But what this guy did is he took all those papers, took their code and put them in a fair apples and apples comparison and then redid this. And he found that the line was flat. There has been no progress in 15 years. It's just that these people unintentionally were using different uh, setups, not making apples and apples comparisons and tweaking things so that their method was just looked a little better than the next guys. And so it is a real and present danger to, to fool yourself into thinking you're doing better than you are if you don't make fair comparisons. Can you elaborate on some of the things that they did? Why did the y axis are identical? Yeah, so, so what they did to equalize it is that they, um, there's a lot of things like, for instance, uh, we've talked about backbone architectures or these models. So if, you're, if you use a ResNet 50 and I use a ResNet 18, that's not a fair comparison, even if we're using the same loss and the same parameters and everything else, because you have a bigger model than I do. So that's the kind of thing that they're equalizing. Sorry, could you say Because this trend is fake. This, this is an illusion of progress. I think a lot of it has to do with like um, our hardware has gotten better. Our like avail our ability to like sort of the way that we train these models and like sort of like the efficiency. Like there's things that have changed. Is that at all? Like we, we I think it's not a hard larger hard. architectures than we could in two thousand six on big views like that. But I, then now they they kind of retroactively looked at the methods that we developed in two thousand six, but like using like the same sort of infrastructure and everything, and they saw that actually the methods are performing the same. Got it. Okay. Is that true? I think it's it's no. I think it's more of a methodology thing. So it's mm -hmm. like this paper to this paper, they used a different amount of. Um, resources to search for parameters. And this paper to this paper, they use different backbone architectures. So if you think about all the choices you have to make when you train a deep network, like, you know, how do I optimize my high parameters and what's my architecture and what's my loss function? Those are all important choices. And all of these people are choosing different things for those choices. And here, they're making all the choices the same. So that they're making these comparisons very possible. And what they're finding is that these key components of code are actually not producing improvements when you make a fair comparison. So I, I mean, totally. But I do think that actually advancements in hardware are part of it because we now have the ability, or or even just infrastructure, like the ability to train a bunch of different things in parallel on the cloud, enables us to train, uh, do a much larger hyperparameter suite because we can now train you know seven hundred models. Yes, it will cost you money, but in two thousand six, that infrastructure wasn't there, and so they just could not physically do as many comparisons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that. Are you saying that the less hyperparameter fine tuning rather than they can do now? So they're teaching the method the same, but just like finding the optimal hyperparameter. Yeah, because what's going on in these first ones, they maybe they weren't doing as much tweaking, and now 
towards the end of this graph, people like, especially to get that one extra percent, they will do like a ton of hyperparameter training on like a bunch of. Right? I, the, the, the takeaway here, um, so I mean, it's a great paper. You should read it. Uh, I mean, it's maybe you shouldn't read it, but it's a great paper. Um, but the point is that it's easy even for people who do this all day long to fool themselves into thinking they're doing better than they are by accidentally doing unfair comparisons. So there's no like malice here or mischievousness. It's just that when you are building one of these methods, you are motivated to make it work as well as possible. And you're comparing to something else that you are not motivated to make work as well as possible. So it's important to make sure that you're making comparisons that are super fair, go out of your way to give advantages to your baselines. So that then when you, when you show progress, you know it's real. Yeah. instead of a consequence of uh, you know not using as much resources for both uh, both methods. And I think this I we have like a reading group on this in Google. And basically it was just like it's as simple as you guys are going to your first models that you're training are sort of these very vanilla models and you're like, this is my baseline. And then you start making all these tweaks, but you don't like you don't necessarily it's even just making your own baseline and then starting to try different things and compare against it. Um, it might be true that the final model you get is better, but it's not necessarily true that you then try this hard to get the baseline better. And so you'll like add additional stuff, like you'll add the temporal dimension or something. And you'll say, oh, look, my thing's doing much better. But sometimes it's just the baseline could have been just as good if you invested as much time as the very dimension. And so even just on a new problem, people run into this all the time, where they just are like, here's the off the shelf thing, here's the thing I made, my thing is better, but actually it's, it's just really important to time. Yeah. And then the last point here is that there's a lot of things you can measure beyond how well your model makes predictions, right? This is plenty of things we could care about. So we could care about speed or some notion of fairness or how much carbon footprint does it take to train the model? Uh, how simple it is to implement and run, and data efficiency, like how much training data do you need to get good performance? So there's tons of things you can measure. We focused on predictive performance here, but there are metrics for all of these things that are worth thinking about and being aware of. One big one I think um, that comes up a lot is just uh, like robustness and reliability to hyperparameters, particularly in spaces where you're re resource constrained, which is basically all of ecology compared to Google. Um, so one of the reasons I think that red nets still get used really widely is that red nets tend to be pretty robust and pretty reliable to your choices of hyperparameters. And like, so you don't need to train as many different models to find one that's going to function well. Whereas something like a visual transformer, like if you train 200 of them, one of them will probably be better than that red net, but you had to, you had to train 200 of them, like it's less, like there's, there's more in like sort of variance in performance based on these inputs. And for us, we don't have the resources to train like all these things at scale. And so actually just like reliability ends up being a huge thing. It's hard to come up. Yeah, there's a lot of finicky stuff out there that like yeah. certain papers have a reputation of like, oh, I have six friends that have tried this and like it just like is it's sketchy and finicky and like we believe that they got it to work, but like when I try to use it for something else it would just like immediately fell apart. And so you have to watch out for things that are complicated because they, they do that more often. This has been my experience with GANs, <laughs> for example. Cool, well, that's all the content I have. Um, just want to leave you with the fact that this is, is not as simple as, or, or not as hard as it as it seems because there's these common threads that run through all of these metrics. Um, and under the hood, most of them look pretty similar. So if there's any questions, we can uh, do them now, or actually I think you have, uh, have things to do. So we can take a few questions because I have them. Um, we can go Yeah, so the question is what is a loss function? <laughs> yes, yes. Um so so loss function is how you tell your network what is right and wrong. So it's the, the thing you use to train your model. So usually it's uh, your model makes predictions and the loss function it takes in your predictions and it takes in the ground truth label and it spits out a number that tells you how good or bad you did. And then when you train the model, 
you're changing it so that the loss goes down, so that it gets better at the task that you've uh, defined in your loss function. Uh, so so that's, that's what model training is all about, is like, when you say you train your model, what we mean is you optimize the parameters of that model to decrease the loss function. Then we covered this a little bit in this lecture. Um, we definitely are not gonna get into mathematical details, but basically you're pushing, like you have some defined loss, and then what you're trying, you take the derivative of that, and then you can say which direction is like getting better, basically. And then you move in the direction of that. Um, and that's a very first approximation of what's going on, but essentially you're, you're following the derivative of your loss or of your sort of function, um, your model to try to move in the direction of quote unquote better. So, I guess in like normal statistics and like vanilla machine learning, oftentimes you'll get like different plots to look for red flags, like change for heteroscopicity, and sort of plot plotting in individuals in various ways. It's very like red flaggy type metrics where like you do this insanity check not mm -hmm. to actually evaluate the model, but just to make sure that you're not like super blatantly missing something about your data. I think yeah it's like we're talking about this stuff a lot tomorrow, which is basically like, okay, so you pick one metric that you're gonna look at while you're training. You, you basically it's easy to track one, maybe two numbers during training time. But then once you get a model, then like how you then start poking it and trying to find exactly red flags. Stuff like, oh, I didn't think about this, but actually I've discovered my model is predicting the same thing all the time, and that gives me 90% accurate. But obviously, that's not what I want. Uh, so, different ways to break down your data, your performance on your data, on the training data, on the test data, visualizing what the model's looking at in different scenarios. So you can actually test it. Yeah. 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 And I think the big takeaway of that lecture is going to be you should never look at one number and think that you understand what's happening. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have now open work time until lunch. Um, and I think our big